Um, he is the author of a number of articles and as well as a book, Cultivating Science, Harvesting Power, Science, and sorry, Cultivating Science, Harvesting Power, Science and Industrial Agriculture in California, which was published by the MIT Press in 2008. And today he's going to be talking to us about contested fields. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here uh, for WEETS. I am so excited and, and feel really honored to be here and to, to talk to you all about my research and over the course of the weekend to have an uh, opportunity to talk to many of you about your own research. I feel like in my own research career so far, <coughs> WEETS is pretty much a perfect uh, description of what I do. Uh, history of environment, agriculture, technology of science. If you could just get a sociology in there too, like Wisheets or something like that, <laughs> that would actually be perfect for me. So you might want to consider that, um, being a sociologist by training. But uh, yeah, it, it takes a little work, Wisheets, but uh, it's not bad. Uh, now I, I would keep it Wheats, definitely. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. I'm here to, ta to talk about uh, uh, work that is literally work in progress. I'm on leave this semester working on uh, a new project that hopefully will lead to my, my next book, which is about uh, genetically engineered crops and especially environmental controversies over that, uh, that technology, or that set, a suite of technologies. So I'm going to be talking about uh, this new project, about uh, this technology, um, and especially it's um, the way in which place, and I'll be talking more about kind of what I mean by place and some ways of thinking about place, the way that place comes in and, and mediates, you could say, these debates over uh, genetically engineered crops, um, which I tend to call transgenic crops. Um, maybe some of you guys are familiar with this term, transgenic crops, genetically engineered crops, G genetically modified crops, GMOs. I, I use them somewhat interchangeably, uh, though I do like the, the term transgenic because it really emphasizes the way in which these technologies are created by transferring genes from one species to another that you couldn't really do otherwise. Um, so, for instance, uh, there's a couple of different types. I apologize if you're all really familiar with uh, these technologies, but I thought I'd just talk about them very briefly. Uh, the two most common types are herbicide tolerant crops, which uh, oftentimes are described as Roundup Ready, based on the product uh, that Monsanto sells, has made a lot of money on. <coughs> it's an herbicide that allows them to go through and uh, spray a field, uh, say for soy, which is the most common, probably Roundup Ready crop that's available. Um, and so they can plant their soy and they can uh, let it grow up and when it starts to get competition from weeds, they can just go through a field and spray Roundup all over it or another uh, product that contains glyphosate. And um, it will kill all the weeds, but the crop, since it's engineered to be tolerant to it, won't die. The other type is uh, what's oftentimes referred to as a BT crop based on uh, the initials for the soil-borne bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a bacterium that lives in the soil, is all over the place, and it has a protein that it expresses that's toxic to uh, certain insects in the Lepidopteran category. Um, so basically moths and butterflies, it's toxic to the caterpillars that, um, that those turn into. So um, this one, they uh, take that, that protein or the, the gene that expresses that protein and put it into a plant Again, like uh, especially things like cotton, corn, uh, potatoes, so that they can express that, um, that insecticide, and it's kind of a built-in feature then in this technology. So those are the most common ones, and uh, they've been commercially available for about 15 years now, starting in 1996 is when, if you're a farmer, you could first uh, begin planting them. And over that time frame, they've been pretty successful. I'll give you guys some data in a little bit showing you um, some adoption rates of different types of crops that uh, are transgenic. At the same time, of course, they've been very controversial. I'm sure many of you have heard some of the stories, some of the debates over these technologies. There's people who are the supporters who say that we need this technology to feed the world, um, especially in the developing context, uh, that we're going to use them to uh, basically lift a lot of people out of poverty and out of hunger. And then people on the other side of the debate saying that uh, there's all kinds of problems with these technologies, that they're not regulated enough, they could cause problems with gene transfer between the crops and uh, other species of weeds. Um, they could uh, lead to other environmental impacts, which I'll talk about an example of in a bit. Um, and then also questions about the concentration of production of these technologies within a relatively small number of players who are the big egg biotech giants. Um, well, there's just a handful of them now. So, it's these debates that I'm really interested in studying and what I'm really doing with this project. 
and I'll give you guys some more details as, as I go through it. But first, uh, maybe just a little bit more about the technology and some uh, more details about where it's at. 2010, 366 million acres of transgenic crops grown in 29 countries, and every year those numbers go up a little bit. Uh, 2008, we had uh, just over 300 million in 25 countries. And it's about 10% of crop production in the world now is transgenic crops. At the same time, the U.S. context still uh, is almost the majority of that. Almost half of transgenic crops are grown in the U.S. That's changing. That number goes down a little bit every year, but still you could say that the, 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 a big proportion of it is based in the U.S. context, especially for um, these large agronomic crops. Um, it's described as a revolutionary technology, especially by its promoters, right? So again, something that we can use to feed the world. And um, you've got basically on both sides of the debate people saying that it's something new in the world. And I guess I want to suggest that I'm not sure exactly how new or how revolutionary I guess I, could, I should say it really is. In a lot of respects, I think if you look at how these crops are used, they don't actually change that much about how growers grow crops. Um, in a lot of ways, they're meant to plug into existing systems of production and um, really make it kind of relatively easy for growers to do what they do and to continue what they do without um, having to change much about their production practices. Um, and so if you look at the crops that have been developed so far and those that have been uh, most widely adopted, it really is the really big agronomic crops that are grown on a huge scale. The number one being corn, of course, which is the biggest crop grown in the U.S., grown on many millions of acres throughout the country, but especially in the Corn Belt in the Midwest. Um, then soy, grown uh, throughout the uh, uh, U.S. and also uh, in Canada as well, and cotton, those are the big three that are grown on a, a relatively large scale and that, uh, at least so far, the big ag biotech companies have really focused on those uh, agronomic field crops as the ones that they really um, uh, have promoted and tried to get many growers to adopt. And so in a lot of respects, that technology then has been introduced to farmers in a kind of a plug and play way like kind of a computer where you're supposed to be able to plug in uh, a piece of hardware and it just works, you don't have to worry about it. That's more or less how this uh, technology has been promoted thus far to growers over the first 15 years it's been available. And just to give you an example of that, here's one ad that I found for a uh, Monsanto product. You can see here it's got the uh, description Roundup Ready, okay, so that's the herbicide tolerant part of it, and then Yield Guard Plus that's uh, the insecticide that's built into it. So increasingly these technologies are being what they call stacked together so that you have multiple traits being expressed by the same crop. But look at how they describe this, uh, this new type of seed, corn seed. They say it's the best of everything. Maximum insect protection combined with proven crop safety and great weed control and Roundup Ready 2 corn system. Even better, growing it doesn't require different equipment or significantly different, different agronomic practices. It fits into how you already farm with added profit potential and convenience. See for yourself, da 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 da. Plant it on your acres and watch your potential grow. So the idea again is that you kind of take this technology, just go ahead, use it how you would use other uh, non-transgenic seeds or crops and grow it the same way um, because you can get the benefits from it and then it will reduce maybe some of your costs some of your practices in terms of spraying herbicides or pesticides in that respect. And so you can see then that um, the technology has been extremely successful so far. This is a chart from USDA data that shows the adoption of a couple of different types of crops. BT means again the, uh, the type that expresses an insecticide, HT herbicide tolerant. And for each of them, starting in 1996, when they were introduced, you have just a, a small share of crops that are grown to 2011, where the majority of the, each of these crops are now transgenic that are being offered. And in many cases, again, these different traits are being stacked together in one product. So in some cases, if you're talking about corn, you kind of have to add it up a little bit. Um, the herbicide tolerant, the, the BT, and it's going to be even a higher share really than what's shown here. Um, so 
The most remarkable one being herbicide tolerant soybeans, Roundup Ready soybeans, where we have a 94% share in 2011. So if you look at this shift over 15 years of this technology being available, it's really pretty amazing. If you know anything about the history of agriculture, and especially technological change in agriculture, you're not really seeing any adoption rates going this fast. Um, even things that we think of kind of radical changes to agricultural production methods throughout especially uh, the 20th century, um, things like tractors, things like fertilizer, stuff like that, it takes a while before you get really high adoption rates. It takes on the course of decades usually. And you can see really with these, especially in the case of soybeans, really um, after just a few years, it's already well up to 80%. So I'd say that, I guess I would argue this is a pretty radical shift in how uh, these crops especially, these big agronomic crops are produced. And especially we're talking in the U.S. context here, it's a relatively radical change and quick <coughs> shift. Okay, let me see if I can get back to my other slide now. Oops. Okay. So revolutionary technology. What I think then is that this leads to kind of a paradox. And the paradox is really the, I think, the main point that I want to make today here and really leads me into talking about this um, relationship between place and this technology. The paradox kind of goes like this. <clears throat> if you think about it, almost everything that's driven new agricultural technologies, especially in the last 100 years or more, has really been about trying to transcend the limitations of place in agriculture. Almost everything that they've tried to do, especially with things like fertilizers and pesticides especially, I would say, but also machinery, has been to try to tame place, to try to make it controllable, malleable, make it something where growers can make places the same. And so really, a lot of these technologies have been a way to try to kind of demolish or level place, both figuratively and literally, I think you could say. Okay, and I think uh, if you look at agricultural uh, transgenic crops, it's the same thing. It's an attempt to try to transcend the limitations of place by saying, okay, you can plug this in, you can use it, it will help you to get rid of insect problems, it will help you with the weeds when you spray up uh, Roundup on it. And um, in that respect, transgenics are really just a continuation of this long line of technologies that are meant to help growers get around the limitations, the contingencies of a particular place. Um, and so in that respect, I don't think they're really revolutionary in terms of agricultural practices. They're another step along the way in this, this attempt. And yet, at the same time, what I'm finding in my research is that place is a really important axis of conflict for these debates over this particular technology. And I'll get into some more details as I go through and talk about more specific cases that I'm studying. But place is something that at one, at, at, on kind of one hand, you've got this attempt to kind of get rid of it. At the other hand, it's something that kind of is always around and it seems to be something that uh, is always used uh, kind of discursively but also kind of practically as a, a way of talking about either the promise or the limitations of this technology. And so in that respect, place is an important category for me and I think for people who are studying agriculture, it will continue to be an important category as well. So let me then talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. Okay, so role of place. What is a place? First of all, you have to deal with this kind of fuzzy concept and it's a little tricky. If there's any geographers in the, in the audience, please don't start sharpening your knives already because uh, <laughs> I know that this is your bread and butter category and I'm, I'm uh, doing some boundary crossing here. But uh, I, I personally find that uh, place is at one, uh, it's very promising as a category but at the same time it's kind of hard to work with because isn't every place a place? Um, and really, I, I think the, the geographic category of scale uh, makes that clear how tricky it is to deal with place because is a place this room? Is a place Cambridge? Is a place the larger, greater Boston metropolitan area? Is a place Massachusetts? 
Um, how do you decide? And this really uh, kind of hit home for me in this course that I teach at Colgate uh, that's called Food. I teach a course called Food that's about food and agriculture. And um, students have to do an internship at a local CSA farm as part of the class. So um, they go out there for a few hours every week and work in the fields. And I often try to go out there and help them do whatever it is that the farmers want us to do in that given week. And uh, one time last year I was out there and we were harvesting potatoes. And um, basically uh, what we had to do is kind of dig around in the ground and get them out by hand. Uh, they went through with a, a tractor and tried to, to kind of bring them up out of the earth a bit. But you really had to kind of dig for them to get them actually out of the ground. And uh, we've had a lot of problems in the Northeast, and I'm not sure how it is around here, but back uh, home in, in New York, we've had a lot of trouble with late blight, um, especially later in the summer. Late blight, the disease that caused the Irish potato famine, it attacks both tomatoes and potatoes. So as I was digging down in the dirt trying to get these potatoes out, <coughs> what I found is that there would be one location where I could take out a potato, and it was just a beautiful potato. It was like the Ur potato. And I was like, wow, that's, that's a nice one. I might put that in my pocket and take it home with me. Um, but then you just go like a foot over or a meter over, and you dig, and there'd be the nastiest looking potato you've ever seen. It was clearly very affected by late blight, and it was disgusting. You just kind of pitched it to the side. So within that little spot, maybe just you know a meter square, there was a huge variation in what you're finding in this particular crop. So that really kind of, to me, emphasized the uh, contingencies of place. There's this really micro, micro, micro climate happening right there in that field. So we're not even talking about uh, this farm, which is a 14 acre farm. Just within that little plot, there's a huge amount of variation that um, farmers have to account for. That they have to say, okay, well this field I know drains a little bit better than that field, so I might use it for this crop or that crop. And they're very, very attuned to the uh, contingencies of place and the differences between one field, one place or another. Okay, so we do have some resources in science and technology studies to help us with place though. So it's not um, entirely a lost cause to, to go down this path. We, we know that um, there's been a lot of great research um, on especially the role of place in uh, the formation of the laboratory and the laboratory <coughs> as a place for building consent around knowledge claims and creating facts. And some uh, really good work from this obviously uh, by people like Stephen Shapin, uh, Tom Guerin, looking at even all the way back to the 17th century when the, uh, the laboratory was first kind of being created in the context of the Royal Society. Uh, how is it that, the, that people decided what the rules of engagement were for doing science in a laboratory setting? And who had access to a space, uh, to a particular research place? What were the rules? Who could go in there? Who could witness? Who was going to be a reliable witness? All this stuff is really done brilliantly in uh, Steve Shapin's work. Um, but also Tom Guerin's idea of the truth spot, that particular places can be uh, uh, seen as appropriate or inappropriate for the creation of science or the creation of knowledge. Um, and so in that respect, we do have some good, some good resources that help us to think about place and its role in, in uh, knowledge creation and uh, its role in scientific practices. Then more recently, uh, work by Rob Kohler and others have been looking at the role of the field sciences in place, and especially kind of comparing and contrasting laboratory and field sciences to see what happens there. Some interesting, uh, some really interesting research there as well in things like field biology, geology, uh, and so forth. And agriculture, I think, is an interesting case of this as well, where you don't have the same uh, maybe uh, amount of control over a particular research place as you would have in a laboratory. What does that mean then for the practices? What does it mean in terms of the prestige that we accord laboratories in terms of their ability to produce knowledge and produce consent around knowledge claims? And so in my work, I've been trying to kind of understand what these different categories mean for agriculture. And in some prior work, uh, Rebecca mentioned my, my uh, book about the, the farm industry in California. I, I spent uh, some time doing ethnographic field work in the produce industry in California. Um, I would, I've never checked the, the produce section of grocery stores here in Cambridge, but I would bet that if you go to the grocery store here, whatever local one, and you pick up a head of lettuce, especially an iceberg lettuce that's wrapped in that nice plastic, 
turn it over, look at uh, the label where it's from, it's probably going to say Salinas, California. And that's really the heart of the produce industry in California and Arizona to some extent as well. And that's what I was doing in that work, trying to understand the relationship between farmers in the produce industry and University of California <coughs> agricultural scientists, and kind of a study of the power relations between those two groups. And what I found in that work is that um, researchers who wanted to apply their knowledge and especially get growers to adopt it often had to really account for differences in places and especially growers perception of those differences in their work. Whenever I talk to the researchers or the growers they often always mention this as being an important category for them. Um, that they wanted research that was focused on uh, the actual contingencies of place and it had to be tailored to that or it was going to affect their perception of it. So here's just one quote from an interview that I did with a grower. He says about uh, research from the university, if I only had one request, it's that they understand that in order for them to really perform the work that's going to benefit the people of this valley, Salinas Valley, they need to do the work in this valley, not at the university. They can do all the work they want to up there, and it may be handy for them to do the work there, but it doesn't solve things here. In my opinion, for the problems that are here, they'll have a hard time selling the results if the research is done up there. He's talking about Berkeley, Davis, <coughs> kind of that area where the UC campuses are. And I say, selling it to people in the farming industry, he says, Okay, so a couple things to point out here, I think, in this quotation. Um, first of all, he's referring to a specific place, right? He's saying this valley, this is where uh, the research is going to be more relevant to what we're doing here, to our particular place, the conditions here, <coughs> climactic, our practices, what we do here, our needs. Right? But he's, at the same time, he's also connecting that place to uh, consent, right? That if you want to sell, the language that he uses, uh, something to the farm industry, you're going to actually have to um, make this research happen in that particular place. So there's this connection here then between knowledge, creation, consent, formation of consent around the knowledge, and um, the particular place in which it happens. And so this uh, is something I came across again and again and again talking to growers, that they really wanted the research to be tailored to their place. Because again, of all the contingencies that they're aware of and that they think about on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and that really do impact their own production practices. Okay, once again I'm going to skip back. So in that respect, for me, in my work, I find that one way to get at this issue of how to understand place and make it especially a working category of analysis in research, how do we actually work with this as a category or variable, um, <coughs> is to really focus on the relationship between practice and place. How do practices and place relate together? Again, I think you see this in that quotation that I just gave from the grower. He's talking about how we do things here. And so for me, in my work, and I think especially for agriculture, it's very productive to think about the relationship between practice and place and it helps us to kind of tame this category a little bit. For one reason is because that agriculture is a production system. It's based on a system of practices and that oftentimes those practices are relatively routinized and that they um, are ones that are shared by especially certain commodities or in certain locations. So there's a system, and we saw that in the, the ad for, for the Monsanto product, right? There's a system of practices that they're using that um, are very important to them. They oftentimes have investments in those practices because they may relate to certain types of equipment that they use, products that they're used to using. So they may have material, uh, kind of cultural, other commitments to these types of practices that they're using that are very important to them that represent kind of an investment, you might say. Um, in that respect, they could be seen as kind of taken for granted as well, maybe part of the habitus, to use Bourdieu's term, of uh, what it's like to do agriculture in a particular location. Um, and so in that respect, tying into those practices in a particular place can be useful for a researcher or for a company who wants to sell a product um, to make a connection with them. It's also something I think can help us with the scale issue, right, because we can look at in a particular place, what type of practices are they using to, say, grow crops? And um, especially, uh, I think, if we're talking about environmental issues related to agriculture, and we know that there are many 
uh, environmental impacts of, of agriculture, and that's one of the things I'm interested in studying about uh, transgenic crops. A lot of them do boil down to particular types of practices. How do you fertilize? How do you use a pesticide? Uh, what uh, kind of practices do you use for irrigation or watering? So another th issue that I was studying in the context of the Salinas Valley was contamination of groundwater from uh, leaching of fertilizers that were used by the farm industry there. And there's actually a number of communities in the valley who actually couldn't drink their groundwater anymore because it had too high of a level of nitrate in it, uh, which can cause problems with breathing, especially for the old or the young uh, who may have uh, kind of limited lung capacity. So um, a lot of these practices are really related to um, environmental issues and are often kind of the the entryway for people who are trying to solve environmental problems related to agriculture as well. So I guess the way I like to think about it is that this connection between practice and place is, so to speak, where the rubber hits the road. When we're talking about kind of how people exist in the material world. It really is about this connection between practices and places. This is how we, we live our lives. And for in the case of agriculture, this is how farmers do their job. They think about how do I work in a particular place um, and that really brings together that connection between practice and place for me. Okay, so that's some of the background. I can start talking about some of the cases then. I'm looking at a couple different cases of transgenic crops and how um, they get involved in these debates that bring together the technology, environmental issues, and place. And the first example and the reason why the poster has a picture of a butterfly on it, if you were wondering about that, uh, is what I call the monarch butterfly controversy. And um, this is something maybe some of you can remember. It, it's uh, a little, it's becoming a historical case now. The longer I, I kind of fool around and, and uh, don't, don't publish about it, uh, it, uh, it, it's, a, I guess, 12 years now, in, in May of 1999, a team of researchers at Cornell University headed up by an uh, entomologist named John Losey. Come on in, please feel free. You guys can come in. There's chairs uh, back there. There's one right here. There's a couple here, actually, if you want to come in. Please feel free. Um, this group of researchers published a paper in Nature, a very brief paper. I have a copy of it here if anyone wants to take a look. Just one page um, in the scientific correspondence uh, section called Transgenic Pollen Harms Monarch Larvae. And the article suggested, I can pass it around if you guys want to take a look. The article suggested, based on a series of laboratory experiments where they fed um, monarch larvae pollen from genetically engineered corn and non-genetically engineered corn, regular corn. And they s waited to see what would happen. And it turned out that most of the ones who ate the genetically engineered corn died, and most of the ones who didn't eat the other, uh, ate the regular corn were okay. So um, they published this paper um, in nature, and it immediately created this large storm of controversy in the media about uh, the, the, uh, the relevance or the impact of this technology and the research as well. If you don't remember this, you kind of have to take my word for it. I don't have any <laughs> charts that show lots of, uh, you know, a spike in media coverage related to keywords monarch and, uh, and butterfly and, and, uh, and corn. But it was, it was a big deal. It, there was an article in Time Magazine. It was on 60 Minutes. So there's a lot of attention in the popular press here in the US and throughout the world. Then there's also a lot of attention to it in scientific press as well, um, where you had a lot of debate back and forth about whether or not this finding was, first of all, uh, accurate, could actually genetically engineered corn harm monarch larvae, but also whether or not it was appropriate for it to be published in Nature, which uh, many of you know is uh, one of the, the top two most prestigious science journals, and whether or not this study, which uh, many deemed to be kind of a limited study, was really worth the attention that it got and whether it was worth publishing in a, in a venue like Nature um, in that respect. So there's a lot of controversy about it and a lot of discussion uh, about it. And so what I'm doing in my research then is I'm trying to go and look at the, uh, uh, the initial response to that uh, publication of that article and then kind of what happened after it. So after it was published, you get uh, kind of a, a team of different players from uh, research universities, from uh, biotech companies, from NGOs, 
um, and from government agencies, especially the USDA and the EPA, will kind of come together and say, okay, what are we going to do about this? And certain agencies, especially the USDA, I think, felt under a lot of pressure because they're the ones that, uh, in the end, uh, authorize or don't authorize the commercial production of these crops. And there was a sense that they really had to kind of figure things out, and it led to uh, subsequent research that in the end was published in a series of articles in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2001. And uh, so what I've done then is I've gone around and I've tried to interview a number of the people who were the key players in this debate. Um, and you, you end up kind of doing a, a tour of the, the big land-grant colleges. So Cornell, Iowa State, I visited both of them a number of times. So if you need directions around Ames, Iowa, I can, I can help you out with that. Um, and then also doing content analysis of uh, media content related to the controversy. So doing uh, kind of LexisNexis searches and finding as much as I can about uh, those. And I worked with a number of students at Colgate who have helped me do that research and collect an archive that I can then code using uh, qualitative data analysis software. Uh, so using those two, then I'm kind of looking at the results from that. And what I found is that Many times the critiques, especially of the research, really focused on the place that it, it, it was conducted in. So in a lot of ways, if you're critical of the research uh, from this study, you often reference the place where it's located, um, laboratory or field. And in a lot of respects, it's there, there's a kind of a context, a discursive context that's set up between the artificialness of a laboratory setting and what's often described as the real world of a field setting. And they kind of contrast those two and set them side by side to question the relevance of um, this particular study and other ones that were done similar to it. And so in that respect, it almost kind of turns the, the traditional epistemic authority of the laboratory upside down, right? Saying that in some ways a, a laboratory isn't a relevant place for doing research of this type because you have to really see what's happening to butterflies in a more naturalistic setting. And so subsequently a lot of research was done on that in, in field type of studies. Um, and so a lot, of, uh, a lot of research was done then in, in the, those two subsequent years and what they found is actually that I think many of the players and many of the players I interviewed felt that there wasn't a lot of risk to uh, the monarch in the end. But they actually discovered a lot about the ecology of, of monarchs. One of the big questions that uh, came up during this time was, are monarchs even in cornfields? Why would they go there? Monarch butterfly larvae eat milkweed. Um, and milkweed is a weed to most farmers. And they would spray for it with herbicides. So why would monarchs even be there? And what they discovered actually through a, a lot of this subsequent research is that cornfields are actually a very important habitat for monarchs. And there's even, if you uh, I'm sure you all follow the news very closely about monarchs and corn and stuff like that, but <laughs> this summer there was an article questioning some, some subsequent research about whether or not Roundup Ready crops were actually limiting the habitat in cornfields and soy fields too for monarchs because now they can spray more consistently and there's less milkweed that's available than in the past. So it turns out that actually cornfields are a pretty uh, important habitat for monarchs, especially through the Corn Belt, where they go from Mexico up to Canada and back down again every year. Um, but then also a lot of questions came up about the regulation of the technology and whether or not it was uh, appropriately regulated or is still appropriately regulated. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of that. These are um, all from content <coughs> analysis, media content. So here's a press release that Monsanto releases just after the controversy breaks in 1999. And this press release states, laboratory study in nature provides interesting information but reflects a situation very different than that actually prevalent in the natural environment. Monarch larvae feed almost exclusively on milkweed. The natural habitat, habitat is prairies, fields, and roadsides, not the middle of a full-grown and pollinating cornfield. In real life situations, the exposure of milkweed to corn pollen is very low because only a very small portion of milkweed grows in close enough proximity to cornfields for exposure to corn pollen. Okay, so here you can kind of see a number of those issues that I just mentioned, right? Um, you see them talking about a, the natural environment and how this situation that the laboratory study in nature is from is different than that. Um, talking about the natural habitat and this, again, this question about whether monarchs would really go there considering that milkweed um, 
It doesn't really grow there, although they, they did find out subsequently that it does. Okay, here's another one. Here's a spokesperson uh, for Hi Pioneer Hybrid. Um, and he says, we are very concerned about the environment, making sure our products are safe. BT corn has been approved by the EPA. Their butterfly feeding was very controlled in the LOCI study and not in a <coughs> natural setting. We feel that while this study is fine, far more research needs to be done. The thing to remember is that BT is a very environmentally beneficial product that reduces spraying. Again, here you talk, uh, get a sense of the controlled character of the laboratory. Now it's too restrictive really to allow the full set of variables and variability that you would have in a more natural setting uh, for butterflies to kind of act naturally, I guess, do their thing rather than being uh, kind of controlled and in a petri dish and not having choice. And really in some ways this is actually a different part of the research that I'm not talking about as much today, but kind of an interesting way of talking about the agency of butterflies, whether or not they can be free agents and act as they should in a natural setting or are they controlled and not really being allowed their full range of agency in a laboratory setting. That's another part of the research that I can talk about more in the Q&A if anybody is, is interested in that part. Um, but then also here at the end, emphasizing, kind of making that point at the end about the uh, environmental benefits of this technology and the fact that it uh, requires less spraying of conventional pesticides. So here's one more, one final one on this part. BT corn was not, this is from the EPA. BT corn was not expected to cause widespread or irreversible harm to non-target lepidopter and insects, butterflies. Reports of toxicity of high doses of BT uh, to monarchs in the laboratory do not necessarily mean that there will be exposure to toxic levels in the field. EPA has been participating in an aggressive research effort to assess the field significance of this finding. So again, um, EPA also using this language about whether or not really there's a problem or not since there's kind of a disconnect perhaps between the research and the laboratory in the field. Okay, so that's one part of it. Then the other part is I'm, uh, again, using this content analysis approach, trying to keep track of different uh, protests, vandalism, other kinds of uh, demonstrations against transgenic crops globally. You don't see it here in the U.S. as much, but if you do follow the news globally, you'll actually find that there's quite a few news stories that come across on a weekly or at least monthly basis about protests in different locations uh, about transgenic crops, especially those being grown on kind of an experimental basis. So field trials that maybe Monsanto or another co a company is trying to grow in say France or Australia or Thailand and uh, trying to see whether or not they grow okay in that particular place um, and testing them uh, for their viability there. And so what I'm trying to do is then kind of track what people are doing and especially what they're saying about these, um, these technologies and uh, whether or not there's uh, some kind of reference to this issue of place and uh, especially place practice and uh, research. What I found here is that it's uh, in some cases, and I guess I should say that primarily again, what the, the findings are, are in Europe, Asia, and Oceania are, are where you're mostly gonna see these stories because in the US it's so, uh, hidden now, it's such a part of our food stream that people aren't really talking about it or protesting it as much, although there are some cases where you have um, people that are um, trying to change legislation and, and so forth to, to impact uh, whether or not the technology can be grown in, in U.S. context. But what you see here is kind of uh, the reverse of, of the other one. In, in the, the other situation, a lot of times the laboratory is being referred to as a place that's kind of unrealistic. In this case, you have a lot of protesters who are against transgenics holding up the laboratory as a safe space for uh, transgenics. And the field is kind of an uncontrolled or unsafe space for transgenics. And really saying that the laboratory is only the only appropriate place for this technology which they view as dangerous and kind of uncontrollable um, that could lead to uh, problems. And so you also have a lot of uh, discourses of contamination and purity that go kind of hand in hand with that then about whether or not there's some kind of contamination from putting uh, this technology and planting it in a specific location and whether that's a problem for their particular place. Um, and so what I'm trying to do then is look, 
look for those uh, types of discourses. And here again are a couple examples. Oops, sorry. Here's one uh, from a protest in New Zealand. A Greenpeace activist said, the only safe place for genetic research is a properly contained laboratory. So that kind of sums it all up right there. Right, again, that this is, this is the place where you could do it and you could have it be, uh, be safe. Otherwise, no, it shouldn't be here. France, interesting case. Um, you, many of you maybe have heard of this uh, anti-globalization activist, Jose Bové, who's been really involved with uh, a movement, broadly speaking, you could call it anti-globalization, but also very involved uh, with protests against transgenics. And so in the case of France, he and other groups have literally gone out into the field and destroyed uh, experiments that are using transgenic crops. And there was a court case actually where the judge basically threw out the charges on some of the, the people who were involved with that. And the judge in this case for a group of people who were uh, charged with destroying a Monsanto field trial said, the unbridled distribution of modified genes constitutes a clear and present danger for the well-being of others in the sense that it could be the source of contamination and unwanted pollution. Again, the idea that it's a technology kind of run amok, that you can't really let it out loose in the wild, otherwise it's going to lead to this contamination that he refers to. And then this isn't so much a quote, but just a story that I think is really interesting that in 2008 it was reported that in uh, Great Britain, the cost for security for these uh, experiments was actually higher than the cost of doing the research itself. Um, in many cases, these uh, locations are, are hidden. And there's been debate about whether or not there should be a right for people to know whether or not in their proximate to their home or where they are, that there is some kind of uh, 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 experiment going on that's testing this technology. So overall then, I think you get a sense that um, the practices of scientists and their research whether it's uh, in a place like the laboratory or a field setting, are really kind of interesting categories that are being used to debate this technology, and whether or not it's having some kind of environmental impact. And so um, that's the kind of thing that I've been looking for in this project and I found really fruitful. And I, I guess I would say that one thing I would want to think about for myself um, throughout the, the course of our discussions, especially about the papers that we're going to be talking about tomorrow, is are there other ways in which you could imagine some of these similar ideas coming out, some of the same lines being drawn, or maybe different lines being drawn. And that's, you know, maybe I'll sound like a broken record tomorrow, but I'll, I'll be uh, trying to talk about then, I think, some of the ways in which place could be fruitful for other cases as well. They're looking at agricultural issues, environmental issues. And I think if you look at, I mean, social scientists should never make predictions, I think. That is pr uh, the, the worst move that we can make. Uh, I know uh, sociologists sometimes do it, economists do it all the time, but we're not very good at it. Uh, but I guess I would, if I had to make one prediction, I think that if you want to trace uh, this technology over the course of the 21st century, and obviously it's something that keeps growing and growing all the time, so it's going to be an important part of our food systems in the 21st century, I think that place will continue to be a role because you just can't get away from the fact that agriculture is done in a patch of soil somewhere. Um, or if, I guess if you're talking hydroponics in a tank somewhere, right? It's always going to be something that is emplaced. And so in that respect, I think when we're looking at transgenics, we're looking at other issues related to agriculture, place is something that we're always going to run into because it is such a material, such a, a specific place-bound activity. So thank you so much for listening. I look forward to any questions, comments you have. Thank you. Thank you.